helpful. Um, so welcome everybody. So I'm really happy to be to be here, and for sure, I, I wish uh, Gilles a happy birthday. Uh, um, like many others in the in the audience, I think that the first time I met Gilles was in uh, in Oswa. This was uh, one of my very first conference. And then after that, I was hired as a maître de conférence in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, in the Laboratoire de Probabilité et Modèles Aléatoires. I was not in the team of, uh, of Gilles, but uh, Gilles uh, played a great role with me because he, he, he offered me the possibility to join many activities of the team of numerical probabilities. And uh, really, uh, this, uh, this was really, really useful for me. And, um, I really appreciate it at this time. So, so thank you, Gilles, for this. Um, and somehow what I'm going to speak about today is, is connected with what, what I learned, some of the things I learned with you uh, when I was in, uh, in Paris, because uh, uh, you did some works about uh, numerical methods for backward equations with quantization. And I worked with Stefan about this. And somehow what I'm going to speak about today is connected with this, uh, with this kind of questions, even, the, even, even though this is, uh, this is revisited in another context. Um, so the question is, is to solve, not exactly numerically, but to learn the solution of, of midfield games and to try to see whether we can make some exploration or use some exploration principle to learn the solution of a midfield game. Basically this is, this is the philosophy of what I would like to talk to you today. Um, so this was, this was the, the picture of the conference. I'm not going to make a, 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 a complete uh, exposition of minfield game theory. I just would like to be quick and to explain to you what is the motivation from the, from the learning point of view. So minfield game is, is, is a theory that is due to, to Lyons. Lassery and Lyons did so much on the field and also people from engineering in Canada, Wong, Kens and Malamy. And, and the point is, try, is to try to get some equilibria or some compromises for um, large populations of weakly interacting uh, agents or players. And so the famous example you have uh, on the picture on the slide is, uh, is one of the favorite examples that Lyons used in his lecture at the, College, uh, at the College de France. So you see that you have many vehicles. And so somehow these are the players in the, uh, in the game and each of the, each of the vehicles or each of the drivers wants to, to exit as, uh, as fast as possible from the, uh, from the roundabout. And so everybody has to minimize uh, some, some stochastic optimal control problem. Uh, but given the fact that there are some interaction with the others, and this is, this is the point that, or this is where you have the game. And, and the, next, the next one is to say that since you have many particles and, and somehow there is a lot of homogeneity in the structure of these particles, it makes, it makes sense to use mean field theory. So this is the starting point of Minfield games. So the, the way I'm going to introduce Minfield games is, is through a, a series of pictures. I, I don't want to write too many equations now. So let me just have this, uh, this series of boxes. Um, I would say just to simplify that a Minfield game is a kind of black box. So this is the gray box that you have on the, on the slide. And the inputs of these boxes or of this gray box, there are two inputs. There is somehow the action that is chosen by one tagged particle, one tagged driver in the roundabout. So this is the yellow box. And in the green box, you have the state of the population. You have the state of the others. This is what I would like to call the environment. And so you put these, uh, these two inputs in the, in the gray box, in the black box. And, and what the black box does is that it computes a cost for the roundabout. This would be uh, the cost to, to, uh, to leave the roundabout. And it returns somehow the optimal trajectory given the state of the environment. And even more, it gives you the optimal low 
of this or the low of this optimal trajectory. So this is the the box in red that you have at the at the bottom of the slide that you have here. So you're able to to compute given the black box. You say it will be given the state of the environment. This is the the low of the uh, of um, of the optimal state. And what you want to do in in minfield games is to say I want an equi an equilibrium. So I want a kind of of compromise. And saying that I have a compromise is to identify the green box and the red box. So this is to say that you have a fixed point. So the state of the population is precisely the, the low or the, 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 the distribution of the optimal state given, uh, given the state of the population as an input of the black box. So you want to solve a fixed point. And now you would like to say, or you would like to have a kind of learning procedure to solve this, this black box. But when I say learning in my mind, this is a bit different from a numerical method. What you want to do is you would like to solve or to learn an equilibrium without having access to the details of the black box. You just want to say, I am able to tune the inputs and I can observe the outputs. So let's say I can observe the cost to any given particle and given many, many particles, maybe I can compute the empirical distribution, which is going to be a proxy for the statistical distribution of all these particles, if they are sufficiently homogeneous. But you don't know exactly what you have inside the black box. So that's, that's the point, and this is the reason why I use the notion of learning. Um, so the question is to say how to do that uh, mathematically without speaking about data first, uh, how could you do that? And, and certainly you can guess that what you need is to update depending on the outputs of the black box, you need to update the state of the population. So you say, I have a proxy for the environment of the population. I put my tagged players in that, I solve the optimization problem. I don't know exactly how it works inside the black box. I observe the results and I'm going to update the environment given the return of the black box. And so for sure something that is, oh yeah, maybe I should say that in the SQL, I'm going to have a look at stochastic uh, control problems. So basically these are on the, on a finite time interval. So capital T is the end of time for me. And at any time T mu T, is a probability measure that describes the, the statistical state of the population. So what I was saying is that you have to, to update the, the, the state of the environment. So let's say that you have a sequence of learning of, of learning steps. At, at, any, at any time of this learning step, you learn a new step for the, for the population. So this is for sure something that is really heavy numerically speaking because you want to learn the state of a population so you can guess that this should be really costly anyway you may have a swarm of robots and you would like to to, to learn some 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 equilibrium states for this uh, swarm of robots this could be an example and so you have at iteration number n you have a proxy for this and you say you run through the black box you have uh, the the law of the optimal state and a naive thing would be to say, I'm going to update by means of a Picard iteration. Uh, the answer is that this is not a good idea. And this is precisely connected with what I said before, because behind infield games, there are plenty of forward backward equations. And this is pretty well known that in fact, brute force Picard schemes do not, do, do not work for, for, for forward backward problems. So this one is, is not a good point. So what people do from uh, what people from game theory do is that they have something that is less ambit ambitious than 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 Picard iteration. Somehow in Picard iteration, your new guess is is too ambitious. So so there are too many fluctuation in the in the state of the population to get convergence. So the rule that is used in game theory is called fictitious play, and so you see that the update is much much less ambitious. So you have an update with a very, very small step. So you use the return of the black box at step m plus one, and you see that you put a weight that is decreasing with the number of iterations. And this is a way to update your, your, uh, the state of the population. 
And the good point is that it works, but not, not in all cases. In some cases, I'm going to tell you next, uh, at least one of these, uh, of these cases, generally speaking, there are two cases for which this is known to work. And you have some the names of some people who studied this. So Cardali again, Hadi Kanlu did that from a theoretical point of view. And then uh, Francisco Silva, Romuald Deli, Mathieu Laurier did things from numerical or learning point of view. What I would like to, to do is, is to go beyond these, these examples. And my guess is that I would like to randomize in some way the action of the players, exactly as what people do in reinforcement learning. So you say, I would like to randomize the states to learn in a better way what is the state of the, or what is the shape of an equilibrium, which is for sure this is a, a common or a standard idea in, in, in learning. But the way I want to randomize the state of the player is, is, is in such a way that at the end of the day, this is the whole state of the population that becomes random. And somehow what I want to do is to have a random exploration on the state of probability measure. So it looks an impossible program because you are going to say the space of probability measure is so big that this is the noise is very would be very complicated to, to get some exploration. So this is the reason why I'm going to simplify and to have a look at the simpler setting. But it turns out that once again, I want to randomize the action in such a way that the state of the population becomes random and I'm going to explore in some way the state of probability measure. So just to simplify, uh, what I'm going to do is to have a look or even more to simplify it. At least uh, so far, I, I would not be able to do that in, in, a, in, a, general, in a general manner. So, so this is really, really meaningful to simplify. And the way I'm going to simplify is to, is to have a look at what I call in the title linear quadratic mean field games. So this is a common example in the field. So let's say that if you take your tagged particle in, in, the, in, the, in the population, you see that alpha is the control. And there is some noise here. This is absolutely not the noise that is used for exploration. Here, these are just shocks that are proper to any of the particles. So each particle has his, its own shocks exactly as in the, in the mean field particle system. Um, and then mu bar here, you have this mu bar in blue. This is the mean state of the population. So I'm going to simplify the mean field interaction. You just see the orders through their mean states. So you just see the mean of the population. And you see that you recognize that this is a kind of typical uh, cost functional that you may have in, uh, in stochastic control. This is the terminal boundary condition. And somehow this is the final states of the, of the particle. And you want to be as close as possible as a target given in terms of the mean state of the population. And this is the same for the running cost and then you pay for some type of kinetic energy in the control. So this is just a benchmark example, and I'm going to show you why this is really useful in, in what, in what we, we want to do. Here, the sigma is not really useful for the analysis of this uh, control problem. The reason is that the coefficients are convex in X, so sigma will be mostly, mostly useful from the numerical point of view. And so the very good point is that when the environment is frozen, so if, if you remember the picture I told you, when the green box is given, so the state of the population is, 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 is fixed, I'm just solving something that is linear quadratic because I'm just solving something that is in X. And I know, everybody knows the answer of something of this shape. I know that the feedback, the optimal feedback are going to be linear in X. And there is an intercept patch, and this guy is going to play a major role in the rest of my, uh, of my talk. So the optimal trajectories uh, follow these types of dynamics. So keep in mind that this is uh, um, linear in X plus some intercept, and I'm going to use many, many times this notation hatch for the intercept. The good point is that the coefficient eta that you have in front of the X here, it does not depend on the choice of G nor F. So in fact, it's, 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 it's the solution of a Riccati equation, and it only depends on C, G, C, F, so you can choose anything you want. It's not, it's not going to be a big deal in my, in my analysis. So the crucial part here is to say that conditional on the, the initial state of the system, this is a Gaussian process. 
And so when you want, when you want to compute its, its distribution, you just have to know its variance or the, the marginal variances and the marginal means. But in fact, when you compute the marginal variances, they are given just in terms of sigma. And there is no need to know f and g to compute the marginal variances. So the only thing that is really unknown in terms of the environment in these dynamics is, is what's, going, um, what's going to be the mean of, of x. The mean is really the subtlety here. And so my, my setting compared to the, to the original objective that I had in mind, now my setting is much simpler because I'm reducing myself to the space of Gaussian measures. And now doing some exploration is just doing some exploration onto the mean of these Gaussian measures. So you see now that the space is finite dimensional. Certainly this is, it's going to be easier. Anyway, you can solve the Riccati equation. So this is something that is absolutely straightforward. And if you want to compute the intercept, H, that's really the key, the key point here. Well, this is the solution of a backward equation, not stochastic, just a, a, a completely deterministic backward equation. And in this equation, you recognize the cost coefficient f of mu bar, you have the terminal condition g of mu bar, and you just have to compute this. And now you say, well, let me go back to the definition of an equilibrium. And to get an equilibrium, I have to compute the mean of this guy. So I'm going to compute the mean of x. So I just take the expectation and I get a forward backward system. And I say that at the equilibrium, I need the low or the mean of x to be equal to mu bar. This is the definition of what should be a, a mean field gamma equilibrium in this, in this setting. So I have a forward backward system. This is the starting point of, of the analysis somehow. And you know that uh, forward backward system are, are, are difficult to solve uh, because uh, you may have some, some many several solution, I should say. And so you just have Cauchy-Lipschitz there in small time and in larger time, you may lose existence and uniqueness. From a PDE point of view, it's connected with the fact that uh, a forward backward system of this type, in fact, is a system of characteristics of a nonlinear PDE uh, that would be in dimension one, just a Burgers equation of this shape. And you may have some singularities to the solution to this PDE, and then you may lose existence or uniqueness, I should say, to, to the forward backward system. But if if f and g are non-decreasing, I put a bar here, but this is a mistake, for, for, forgive me about this, then you have existence and uniqueness. So in fact, for this type of equation, if f and g are non-decreasing, you have existence and uniqueness. And if you go back to the picture I gave you before, so to this one, uh, without any randomization of the equilibria, well, this is, this is one, one of the situations where this, fictitious play is known to converge. There are two situations for which this is known to converge, and this is one of them, where we have a kind of monotonicity. This could be rephrased in a much more general setting for more general minfield games, but in my own framework, this is exactly what it says. I need f and g to be non-decreasing if this is in dimension one, and if this is not in dimension d, uh, this is non-decreasing in the sense that you take fx minus fx prime in a product with x minus x prime and you, you want this to be non-negative. So here, my, my picture here, this is just in dimension one, I should have said that. In any case, the fact that you have a noise in the dynamics, the, the fact that you had this, this dw is not helpful for the, for the analysis of the equilibrium because you take the mean and when you take the mean, you kill this brown emotion here. But now there is something that comes in, which is something that uh, uh, is known in BSD theory, is that if you put, if you take the, the same forward backward system, but if you put a noise in the forward backward system, so this is not the same noise as before, this is no longer W, but this is what I'm going to call B, this is a new ground motion that is independent of W, then I get existence and uniqueness to this system. And so uh, there are several ways to, to see that. The first one is to say that if I put a noise, then I'm going to have a Laplace term in this equation. And so uh, uh, this equation is going to have a classical solution. So certainly there should be also a uniqueness to this, uh, to this system. Or maybe from a probabilistic point of view, this is easier to say that 
I can make a kind of Gerson of argument to remove the hedge here to pass the hedge in the backward equation. And then the two equations are decoupled. And so this is much easier to solve. So this is a, a hint uh, for which we, we should have a kind of uniqueness here. Anyway, we have existence and uniqueness if F and G are, let's say, Lipschitz and, and bounded, which is much more general than what I had before with monotonicity. Now you say, or you could say, what is the interpretation of this, of this B in terms of my original main field noise? And, and this is in the field, something that people call a, a common noise. It means that if you have, uh, if you have your tag particle, now this is, uh, this is submitted or this is subject to two noises, the original one W and the new one B. And in the fixed point condition of mean field games, when you compute the, the optimal state of X, then you compute the conditional law of X given the common noise. This is not the conditional law, this is not the mean, but this is the mean given the common noise. From a particle point of view, it says that somehow all the players feel the same noise B. They feel independent realizations of W, but they have the same realization of the noise B. So when you take uh, the law of large numbers, you, you see this common noise. Now the question is how would you like, or how could you use this, this smoothing result, because this is a, a smoothing result uh, for learning, uh, to make some exploration and to improve the convergence of the learning scheme. So once again, this is not a, a numerical method that I want. There, there are plenty of numerical methods, either for PDEs, FBSDs, and this is, these are things that I did with Stefan based on quantization methods. Uh, uh, inspired from the works of Gilles and BSDs, but this is not what I want. Uh, here I would like something that is that is not based on the on the knowledge of the cost coefficients f and g. I just want to 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 have an algorithm that that uses the observation of the total cost at the end of the day. So the formulation would be as follows. I could say, well, assume that at step N of my learning procedure, I have a proxy for the random mean. Now this is random because I have this uh, common noise, the random mean of the states of, of the population. And then given this random mean, I do as before, I solve, uh, I minimize this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this cost. And then if I use Pontry again principle, I'm going to see that the new conditional mean is going to solve this forward equation, which is basically the same as before, except that now it fills uh, this intercept. And now the intercept depends, or oh, this is given by a new backward equation. And in this new backward equation, I see the state of the population at the previous iteration. So this was my proxy at step n. And, and this mn plus one is the, this is the mean state of the population at the next step. And n here with the bar, this is the proxy uh, for, the, for the equilibrium. So this is the mean state of the population I had in my learning procedure. And so you, you could like, or you would like to say, well, I'm going to make the same kind of updates as the one I had before by using this fictitious play, which is to say, I have this updating rule with this weight one over n plus one. So with a, a step that is decreasing as the number of iterations increases. But this one, I'm not able to prove that this is convergence. I'm not able to use the noise for this one. So I have to do something else. And, and what, what I proposed, and, and this, is, this is the subject of, of a work that I'm doing with one, one of my PhD students uh, in this, uh, is that, um, in fact, we are going to, to compute the cost but under or for a new common noise that is obtained by tilting the common noise. So you say at any step of the iteration procedure, what I'm going to do is take the original common noise that I, I was given, and I'm going to, to, to make a perturbation or a correction of this common noise by the output at the previous step of the learning algorithm, the output, for the intercept. So really you have to keep in mind that the optimal feedback that is given by this learning procedure, there is an intercept in this and hatch at, at step N of the, of the learning procedure. This is the, the proxy, the approximation of this feedback of this intercept in the feedback. 
so at rank number m. And instead of using b as a common noise, I use this tilted Brenner motion. And when I compute the new cost, I say, OK, I'm going to make a Gerson of transform just to say that, in fact, under my new measure, this guy is indeed a Brenner motion. So when I'm going to compute the mean cost of the popular of um, over all the possible realization, if you want, of my tag player, then I'm going to average with respect to the to this uh, to this Gerson of weight. And a very good point is that when you do that, you reproduce somehow the Gerson of argument that permits to decouple the two forward and backward equation in the system that I gave you before. So the point is that. It works because when you were, when you write the new scheme, when you say I'm going to replace uh, B by this tilted Brenner motion, I have that the new scheme in the in the in the driver of the four in the in the drift of the forward equation, I see the new intercept minus the previous previous intercept, and this minus really comes from the fact that I have a minus here that the, that is given by the law of the optimal feedback. So minus minus it makes plus, and this is my original B plus the tilt. And so I get this, uh, this sequence of iteration. And this one, when you compute indeed the rule that is given by the fictitious place, so when you make the mean of, this, uh, of all your past observation for your, for, your, for your population, which is exactly the updating rule that you have in the fictitious play, you see that indeed, your, your proxy at step n plus one is going to be given by, when you make the sum of these guys, this is something that is telescopic. And when you normalize by n, you get O of one over n. So it's going to disappear. And at the end of the day, you completely decouple the two equations and you recover the fact that in the limit, you get the decoupled system um, that is obtained by applying a gear sign of transform from the original FBSD to the new one. So this is the reason why uh, intuitively uh, this should be able to use a common noise to make the learning uh, procedure uh, uh, converge. So one, one very first result in this direction is that if you compare or if you compute the weak error at the end of the, of the, of the algorithm, so if you take iteration number n, so this is the Gerson of transform because you want to say that this is the right law under which you compute uh, or you have to compute or you have to integrate uh, the observation of, your, of, your, uh, of the outputs of the algorithm and you compare with what is um, the right distribution of the solution of the equilibrium, then you have that it converges at a rate that is one over n. And when you restore epsilon, because the analysis I did here is for epsilon is equal to one, when you restore epsilon, you, you, you can prove that in fact, you have one over epsilon. And for sure, this is worse and worse when epsilon gets to zero because the problem is become singular. And so this is not really surprising that you pay a high cost. Somehow this is a kind of trade-off between exploration and exploitation. You, you make some exploration, but it's very difficult if the noise is, is, is very small to be, to be very accurate in the, uh, in the approximation. But from the numerical point of view, this is not the end of the story. If you, if you are back to the original problem, which was how to compute uh, or to learn an equilibrium, there are two drawbacks. The first one is that a common noise is not meaningful in the original problem. I don't see a common noise in the original problem. So what is the meaning of this? And, and the point is that, how can I put a common noise in, in my black box? So let me give you two, two intuitive answers for this. Uh, in the original problem, there was no common noise. And here, what I tell you is that I solve or I learn the solution of a problem with a common noise. And so in game theory, there is a notion for that. We say that we learn an approximated Nash equilibrium. So it says that, in fact, what we have learned when epsilon is, is given is fixed. So the intensity of the common noise in my model, what we do is that we don't exactly learn a Nash equilibrium. We learn an approximated Nash equilibrium, which says that if you freeze, or if you, if you call M epsilon the solution of the game with a common noise, and if you make, if you solve the optimal cost without common noise, but under the environment given by the common noise, 
And if you compare with the optimal state as computed with a common noise, then you can improve, but what you improve is very, very small when epsilon tends to zero. So this is a way to say that when epsilon is small, what I'm going to learn is very acceptable from the, in terms of the original, of the original problem. The, the second difficulty is that in fact, in, in the series of black box I had, or boxes I had, uh, there was no, there was no, um, there was no common noise. And in fact, what I put as an input of my black box is just the action of a control player. This is the alpha. I can tool the, I can tool the control of my player, but I cannot put for free a common noise in the model. It doesn't make sense. Somehow the noises are completely hidden in the black box. And I cannot decide that there is, there is a common noise in the black box. So what I'm going to say is that in the action of the player, I'm, the, I'm going to correct the action by something that is random. And this is exactly the way where you have randomization. And formally, I want to say that the action is corrupted by the derivative of a Brunner motion. This is what I would like to say. For sure, I'm not able to say that. So what I'm going to do is to make some final differences. So I take alpha along a grid or a time mesh, and I make a, a perturbation or randomization an additive randomization by a final difference of the increments of a brown emotion. But this is really to say that I want to recreate a kind of forcing in my, in my dynamics. And the way to do that is to correct the action in the entry of the black box. And if I had plenty of particles, all of them for a given realization of the noise B should be corrupted by the same uh, realization of this, uh, of this noise. And then I apply, I apply the rule as before. And the result is that we can have a similar results as before, but we know how we pay. We know what, what is the, the, the impact of the, of the term discretization in the, in the final error. So just to conclude, let me, let me give you some, some, some numerical experiments. Uh, I have, a, I think a couple of minutes. So we did, uh, so with, my, with my PhD students, we did a, a, a series of, of experiments. The first one I in dimension two. So this is a 2D midfield game. And so we took uh, F to be zero. So there is no F. There is, uh, so somehow in, in the terminal cost, you just have the, in the running cost, you just have the alpha square. This is what it means. And the terminal cost that you take, this, this is a product of cost or, sin, or sinus. And, and, and the, the, the point is that we, we assume that the oscillation is really, really high. So the frequency is, uh, uh, this is uh, highly oscillating if you, if, if you want. And the reason to have this is that we want to increase the Lipschitz constants of the terminal boundary condition. And we know that this is typically what is difficult in forward backward system. When you have very high oscillation, this is really difficult for the forward backward system to be solvable. And here you, you let run an algorithm that is based exactly on the black boxes. So what you do is that you replace uh, your, your realization by particles, you approximate the expectation by Monte Carlo methods and you optimize by tensor flow. So this is a very, very complicated in terms of complexity optimization problem, but this is just to see how it works. And you want to, you want to implement exactly uh, the, the procedure as if you were observing the rewards at the, uh, as, as, as the outputs of the black box. And you see that when there is no common noise, you see what happens. You have oscillation in the cost that is learned by the algorithm. And, and you see that it's oscillating between 1.1 and 1.3 and you, you can carry on, there will be oscillation. If you put noise, as I did this, this exploration noise, then you see that the learning, the, the, the cost that is learned goes very, very close to the theoretical of, in fact, this one is, 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 is computed by solving directly the backward equation if I know exactly the coefficients. So this is really a proof of concept that there is something to do with this exploration on, uh, on this, uh, for, for minfield games. Now you can compute the error between what you have learned and, and uh, what is the theoretical solution or a solution that would be computed by a numerical method if, we, if you really knew the coefficients. So you could exactly use the shape of the coefficients. Here, this is a first plot where I assume that I know what is the Riccati equation. Because in fact, 
if I really say that I don't know, I don't know my black box, I should not know the Riccati equation. And so if I say first, somehow this is a model-based learning method, I, I would first learn what is the solution to the Riccati equation. Then you see that this deal is pretty good. This is pretty good. Now let me show you less good pictures if, if I don't know the solution to the Riccati equation. So I say that TensorFlow is going to learn by itself what is the solution to the Riccati equation. And then just to, give, to explain to you that the role of, of the other noise now is helpful, I gave you two pictures. The first one is that there is only common noise, but there is no W in my model. So it means that for the same realization of the common noise, all the particles behave in the same way. They are not submitted or they are not subjected to independent noises. So are, there are less fluctuations in the system. So now this is very difficult for the for TensorFlow to learn what is the optimal, what is the right solution to the Riccati equation. And you see that the error is not really good. We, we get zero to dot two. Now I'm going to put, to increase the number of, of independent noises. This is really complex because I have two noises. So this is a kind of product probability space. So this is a, a Cartesian product somehow. So each time I have a new, a new uh, realization of, of the noise W somehow, it multiplies uh, or it increases by, by a new factor the, the, the size of or the number of particles. So I cannot have too many of them as otherwise the method would be really, really complex. But you see that if I just put 20 simulations of this uh, additional noise W, you, you decrease by two the error. And you, you see that now this is really the error, the distance, the L2 distance between the, the solution to the FBSD, the, the, the right one as computed by a theoretic or numerical method and the one that is learned by the algorithm, you see that I pass from 0 0.2 to 0 0.1. Okay, so this was just to, to show you uh, some simulation. To, to conclude, if, if I have time enough, I don't know, Mark, if I have time enough. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Well, we're, we're a little bit uh, behind schedule, but that's fine. Okay, so just to conclude, this is just to show you something that is, uh, that could be uh, interesting for some of you who do uh, not mean field game, but mean field control. Let me choose another example of, of a mean field game. Now this is dimension one. I choose the same, the same cost as before that uh, there is just the alpha square in the, uh, in the running cost and the terminal cost is chosen in this form. So there is the same uh, uh, frequency as before, but you see that there is a beta so that zero is a Nash equilibrium. In dimension one, the model is sufficiently simple so that I can compute explicitly the equilibria. And in fact, the equilibria, they are given by the zeros of this function. So you see in blue, uh, this is the function G. And in fact, here, the, the, the zeros are exactly the, the solution to the, uh, uh, the zeros of this function. This is not G, this is this function, I should say. Um, these are the equilibria. So zero is an equilibrium. And I have another one here in the, uh, uh, around my minus zero two and another one ar 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 around minus zero dot five. How to predict what should be the right equilibrium? This is a very nice question. And this is the point where uh, mean, field, mean field games are related to mean field control. In fact, in some cases, you can associate with a mean field game a mean field control. And in dimension one, this is in this model, this is possible. You call capital G a primitive of small g. So small g is this function and you call capital G a primitive of that. And in fact, if you make the computation, you predict that the right equilibrium should be the minimizer of this function. And in fact, you see that really this is the global minimizer in minus 0 0.5. Zero is a local minimizer and minus 0 0.25, this is a critical point, but this is a local maximizer. This is not absolutely not a minimizer. So this is what, there are some proof of this, but this is not completely uh, completely uh, established. This is um, this is what the theory establishes that the equilibrium that should be selected somehow should be given by the zero of the potential. And now what you do is that you let run the the the, the learning algorithm by decreasing step by step the value of the intensity of the common noise so that it reaches exactly at the end of the day. 
the viscosity uh, zero viscosity. So this is a kind of vanishing viscosity method. So just to show you uh, very, very quickly the, the result, I'm not going to explain to you the, the, the method, but you have to decrease step by step uh, what is the intensity of the, of the common noise. You see that you start, you force the algorithm to start from the wrong equilibrium. So this is a kind of local well of your potential, but now somehow the potential, the right potential, this would be a potential for the population. So this should be an infinite dimension, but here this is just the mean and I have simplified the problem so that this is just a problem in dimension one at the end of the day, but the algorithm itself, the learning algorithm is really an infinite dimension. And so you see that my particles are distributed around the wrong equilibrium. And then I reduce the intensity step by step and I, I, I restart uh, the learning procedure and you see the mean of the population. So here these histograms, these are for the mean of the population. And when I decrease the intensity of the common noise, the population becomes somehow deterministic or the mean becomes deterministic. So you, you see the variance uh, reducing on the, on the figures. And so you see that there is a shift in the, in the variance. So at the end, when the viscosity is 0 0.1, the variance is really small and, and you have converged to the, to the predicted equilibrium. So that is, that is the, really the, 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 the global minimizer that you have here. So here, this is just a numerical trial. This is this, there, I have no proof of the fact that you can decrease step by step the intensity of the common noise, but this is just to tell you that this is really a, a method of exploration on the space of, on the space of solution to my main finger. Thank you for your attention.